All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Justin Kay. I'm a field specialist in horticulture up in the Northeast region uh, based in Bowling Green and Pike County. And we're always happy to have you join us for the Garden Hour with MU Extension. Um, I know that we're kind of dealing with varying weather conditions out there across the state. We had a our horticulture meeting with all our horticulturists this morning um, when we do that every week. And so we had some interesting comments from our state forester. Um, Southwest Missouri has really been struggling with some drought conditions. Other parts of the state, uh, you know, maybe lesser drought conditions, but still dealing with the drought. He's noticed a lot of stress, um, even in forest trees in Southwest Missouri, which which really speaks to the drought. And in some of our urban areas, uh, our landscape trees are also really suffering from drought. And he was mentioning that, you know, you might see leaf drop and things like that now, but you might not notice the full signs of the drought effect for another two years. So, you know, that might might manifest itself as a tree that's not healthy, that's more susceptible to, to insect or disease pressure. Um, and, and some of those things might not appear for, for quite some time. So kind of interesting uh, to hear about that. And hopefully we can get him on um, sometime uh, before the fall to maybe talk about some of those lasting drought impacts on trees. So we always like to we always like to share our horticulture coverage map. And so we have horticulturists that cover every part of the state. Um, you can check for your county name there and see who your your local horticulturist is and feel free to reach out to them. We're always happy to answer any of your questions, um, whether it be during the garden hour or outside of the garden hour. If you are in a county that is labeled as open, um, just feel free to reach out to your neighboring horticulturist. We're, we're always happy to help folks um, from across the state. And I think today we're gonna go ahead and kick it off with, with the weather report. Thank you, Justin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been another uh, pretty wet week across the state of Missouri, and I would say actually over about the past 24 to 48 hours with a decent rain event impacting a good portion of the Show Me State. Here on the left are the uh, radar estimates over the past week, but again, most of it did fall within about the past 48 hours. Any of these greens, these darker greens and yellows are indicative of significant rainfall, anywhere from one to as much as three inches. Even a couple of locations got over three inches of rain. So some welcome relief, as Justin had mentioned, some parts of the state were still incurring some drought, especially about the southern half, southwestern sections are really dry. And we've even had some parts of northern Missouri that have been starting to dry out this month. And so it was welcome relief to see all this rain impact a fairly large area of the state. On the right, these are actual totals, rain gauge reports over the past uh, seven days from Kokoraz observers. These yellow dots are indicative of some of the heaviest totals. And I see here this orange stop uh, uh, right up here in Worth County, 3.3 inches. Uh, some healthy totals, again, radar showed that and so do the actual rain gauges. A little bit drier conditions in far northeastern Missouri. They just didn't pick up those rains that came over the past couple of days. Some dry pockets here in west central parts and parts of the Boot Hill, but overall, much of the state saw some significant rainfall. And then this table right here at the bottom shows some of the highest totals, just south of Maryville, over four inches. Grant City, 3.3 inches. Over in parts of Camden County, down the Camden Morgan County line, over three inches. Up in northwest Missouri, Harrison, over three inches. Southwest parts of the state, we had some big rains over there over the past 24 hours. In Barry County, also about three inches of rain. So nice to see and these very pleasant weather conditions. This is not typical of the middle part of August. This is more typical what we're seeing today, perhaps in the middle part of September, the second or third week of September. So enjoy it while it lasts. And it does look like it's gonna last through the weekend and into parts of next week as well with these very pleasant weather conditions. Generally highs today in Southern Missouri is still a little bit cloudy, so they might not make it out of the 70s, but here in mid-Missouri, northern parts of the state, lots more sun, uh, they likely can peak out in the lower 80s. Still, that's below average for this time of year and just some very nice weather conditions that will repeat itself on Thursday statewide with highs in the low to mid 80s. Again, that's below average. 
And then these numbers here through the weekend, the minimum temperatures on top, max, temp max temperatures on the bottom here, very pleasant weather. Give our air conditioner a break, a great opportunity to be outdoors and work in your garden. Low temperatures each morning, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, generally in the low to mid 60s and highs very pleasant in the low to mid 80s throughout the weekend. So some just chamber of commerce weather is the way I see it. Uh, there are some chances of precipitation. I don't want to discount that possibility. Uh, there is an upper level low that's forecast to drop out of Canada today and move into Iowa by later in the day on Thursday and Friday. That could bring some chances of showers, <laughs> and especially across, up across the what? northern half of the state. It does look like as we go into the weekend, uh, these more robust numbers, look at some of these rainfall estimates over the next seven days across southern parts of the state, a very tight gradient, but there are indications of some significant rainfall over the next week, especially here in Oklahoma and Arkansas, where they're indicating anywhere from four to six inches over the next seven days. And in those heavy totals also generally one to three inches across far southern parts of Missouri. That will be nice because that will help start replenishing those surface water supplies and replenishing the soil profile due to the drought that's been in, uh, impacting southern Missouri for much of this summer. It'll, the lighter totals though, anywhere from about a quarter to half inch. Of course, if you're under one of those thunderstorms, they can drop localized heavier amounts, but there are some chances starting in Northern Missouri on Friday, Friday night, and those chances will continue for much of the state as we go into the weekend. This is the forecast for next week. It looks like this cool pattern is gonna settle in for some time. These blue colors indicate an enhanced likelihood of below normal temperatures, and that covers all of Missouri. So it looks like just some really nice weather condi conditions temperature-wise continuing through all of next week. And on the right, these greens are indicative of an enhanced likelihood of above average rainfall. And so it does look like it will continue to be somewhat unsettled as we go into next week, a cool and perhaps a wetter period or much in next week. Justin, that's a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, looks like we're almost dipping into bonfire weather for, for the weekend overnight and uh, definitely a good respite from some of the really hot temperatures we've had um, earlier over the summer here. So thanks for that, Pat. I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to our moderator today, our horticulturist, Katie Kamler. Good afternoon. So our first question is, I have successfully grown eggplant for several years in raised beds with a five year plus rotation among the beds. Uh, this year, mid June, they seem stunted and I noticed a lot of ants around the plants. I saw no signs of aphids or whatever the ants were after. I sprayed neem oil on them, mainly for flea beetle control, but with little impact on the ants. Red of a natural ant control of borax and water placed around the base of the plant, eliminated the ants for a while, but the stunted plants are still not growing and the ants did return. I honestly lost interest in the plants as they were in poor shape. Last year I, or last week, I got down close and noticed many holes in the plant stems that the ants were entering and leaving. Uh, and we do have pictures of this damage. Uh, so uh, just asking what he is dealing with and eliminating it in the future. So Donna Optenberg is going to uh, answer this question. Okay, thank you, Katie. Let me share my screen. Okay, so um, after seeing the pictures and several of us talked about this this morning in our teleconference, um, the stunting that is happening is not most likely due to aphids or, or ants or anything like that. We have had a tough year when it comes to environmental uh, conditions. Too wet, followed by drought. You know, there could be other things going on environmentally um, that could be causing the stunting. Uh, normally, the like I said, aphids and ants don't cause that. Um, and so we would need to look at um, other environmental factors and maybe even have a discussion on what else has been going on with the eggplants. Now, after looking at the pictures, of course, we see that, that it has been riddled with 
flea beetles. But once again, that's not enough to stunt these plants. Once the flea beetles are gone, the plants tend to rejuvenate, put out new foliage and, and grow. So as in reference to the ants on the eggplant, um, there was some damage on the lower stems that the gardener was concerned about um, and that the ants were in and out of these holes. And, and so ants normally do not cause this. If something else has caused it, the ants have it, uh, happen to be inhabiting it. Now the ants could be causing it to be worse because once that damage is started, they tend to you know, maybe um, hollow out the tissue, inhabit the tissue. And so that's one thing you have to keep in mind. Now, you know, they, they're concerned about the ants. How do you get rid of the ants? Well, you know, once again, I'll repeat, you know, when we talk about ants in gardens, ants usually typically don't cause major injuries. They might be a small nuisance. Um, a lot of times we see them in gardens where they're seeking out the sugary nectar in the flowers uh, or the honeydew from the aphids. They're really well known for what we call, um, you know, mining the aphids or mining the uh, the uh, 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 the the sticky substance, the honeydew that the aphids are 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 secreting. Um, once again, they'll inhabit cavities, um, and, and a lot of times people will even be digging sweet potatoes or even regular um, potatoes and find ants inhabiting the potatoes. Once again, damage is caused by something else. They just start inhabiting and also um, uh, eating away at the tissues. Um, you know, another negative to ants is that they can excavate the areas around roots and cause the air uh, to reach the roots and the uh, roots dry out and could co possibly cause some damage there. Um, and then um, just keep in mind, because the most of Missouri has been in a drought um, and in some cases, very extreme drought, um, vertebras and insects and, and, and other critters, they're seeking that moisture. And so as our creeks are drying up and our water sources are drying up, they go to plant material to get that moisture. And so that's when we see a lot of damage happening is when we end up in dry conditions. Before you think about eradicating the ants, I want you to step back and think about you know, how ants can be beneficial. So just remember that ants do a little bit of damage, you know, or no damage, uh, but they do provide quite a bit of benefits. Um, remember they aerate the soil because they're digging in it. Um, they are predators, big time predators to other insects. They will uh, disperse pollen because they're traveling around in those flowers and, and uh, rubbing up against those um, the pollen and transferring it to other plants. Um, and they work with seed dispersal. Um, they will eat the seed coat and leave the meat of the seed uh, to germinate. And, and, and of course, finally, ants are a food for wildlife. So, you know, they may be a problem in the garden, but step back and really think, can I tolerate it? Can the plants tolerate it? And so just keep that in mind before you choose to eradicate them. Make sure that's what you truly want to do. If you choose to control them, choose a pesticide with a, sh a short number of days, especially when we're so close to harvest. And Katie will talk about um, post-harvest intervals in a while, but try to look on that chemical bottle and see how many days you would have to wait between spraying that plant and picking off of that plant. Uh, choose a pesticide that is labeled for the pest as well as the plant. That goes back to reading that label and making sure what's on it. Um, granular baits can be effective, but remember, they're usually temporary. Unless you are actually killing the queen, that population is just going to um, keep rebounding because she's going to continually um, raise young um, or they're going to keep coming out. Um, chemical suggestions, um, carbaryl, pyrethrin, um, a, a citrus oil, you can use all those for, for pray, spraying the plants, spraying the areas. Um, but just, just keep in mind, you can also use it as a hill drench. 
meaning that you're going to be pouring it down that uh, ant hole or that ant, ant mound. And uh, you used to, you need to use one to two gallons per mound. So that's quite a bit of chemical. And I'm just not real, a real, a real big fan of chemicals. So that doesn't sound real positive to me because you're dumping a lot of pesticides in, in the environment. But just keep in mind, a lot of times ants are a temporary problem and you only get temporary control unless you target that queen. And that's all I have. Back to you, Katie. Thank you, Donna. Uh, so the next question is, uh, well, actually two questions, I believe from the same, it's submitted by the same person. One is of a basil plant grown from heirloom seed and identify reason remedy for the recent browning on only some of the leaves. And then I believe also um, with that came a Swiss chard with leaf damage too. And Justin K is going to answer that. All right. Thanks, Katie. Um, so yeah, we got a picture from the homeowner. Um, it was, it didn't come as an attachment. So it was a little bit hard to blow up and get kind of a detailed view. Um, but I'm going to just touch on a couple common foliar diseases of basil um, to give you an idea of what, what we might be looking at here. So one common disease is circospora leaf spot. Um, and you can see the characteristic uh, leaf lesions on the left-hand side. Um, those lesions are kind of bounded by a darker outer ring. And then as time progresses, those lesions will become papery and a little bit lighter in color. Um, this fungi can overwinter for a couple years, um, both infected plant debris as well as is in the soil. Um, you'll notice a lot of similarities in management when we talk about fungal diseases. So, you know, we want to avoid overhead irrigation, use drip irrigation, um, if at all possible. Um, with this one, since it, it can persist in the soil and plant debris, using a layer of mulch to prevent that soil splash up and prevent that fungal spore from making it onto uh, the living leaf tissue. If you see this pop up on your plants, go ahead and try to get those diseased leaves um, out of the garden as soon as possible to prevent it from, from spreading further. It's always important to get your seed from a reputable supplier and your transplants from a reputable supplier to make sure you're not bringing this into the garden on any infected uh, plant material. Uh, so with this one, a two to three year rotation uh, is sufficient for preventing the spread and further infection of Circospora. Um, and in terms of the fungicides that are available to homeowners, uh, potassium bicarbonate is recommended for this one. Now, probably the most common um, foliar disease we see on basil is downy mildew. So this isn't a fungi, it's a oomycetes, which is a, a similar organism, but a little bit different um, life cycle. So with this one, you'll start notice yellowing of the basil leaves. And so you might assume this is a nitrogen deficiency, um, but that, that yellowing will spread outward. And then those yellow spots will actually begin to turn necrotic. And so they're gonna start brown, turn black. You might notice if you turn the leaves over, a fuzzy kind of purplish growth on the underside of those leaves, um, but those, the thing about downy mildew is it creates these these kind of angular looking blotches that that spread outward from the middle leaf vein. Um, it's a, it takes about five to ten days between the time the spore lands on the leaf and symptoms of infection occur. Um, there are some resistant or tolerant at least varieties that are that are available to homeowners. A lot of times, some of these newer resistant varieties. You know, they might only be available in large quantities from commercial seed suppliers, but um, Johnny's Seeds, for instance, has this Prospera DMR, which stands for downy mildew resistance. And so they have that just in a standard um, seed packet size. So once again, you know, avoiding ir uh, overhead irrigation, using drip, you know, plant spacing to help encourage good airflow um, throughout your plants. And then Again, potassium bicarbonate was recommended for this one. And potassium bicarbonate is kind of interesting because it's it does have the ability to kill fungal spores and then it creates alkaline 
conditions on the leaf which are unfavorable to further fungal development but just recognize you know after a heavy rain this stuff is going to get washed off and those those alkaline conditions will no longer persist on the leaf tissue so i tried to kind of blow these up as much as i can it's a little bit hard to see but um i'm noticing some angular leaf patches so um likely looking at uh downy mildew infection and this one develops when high humidity is present over over 85 percent and so you know you can recognize with with heavy rains and high humidity that we have seen you know before this week when it when it cooled off um, it's definitely good conditions for this to to thrive this one doesn't overwinter in soils um, it's actually sp spread either from infected transplants or seeds as well as aerial dispersal of spores and so as I was uh, looking at some interesting university publications, they were talking about kind of a northward progression of downy mildew over the course of the growing season. So um, it can survive in southern soils, um, but not so much in our in our cold climate. It only takes about two hours for these spores to germinate when they have the right conditions. So you can remove infective leaves if you're able to catch this um, quickly enough. Just recognize, you know, you might get spores on your hand. So, you know, washing your hands as you're doing this can be important. It can be pretty hard to do that kind of leaf removal when you have, um, you know, severely infected plants. Uh, kind of also interesting to note, there's a lot of basil produced in greenhouses and they actually use red lights um, overnight. And those red lights have the ability to inhibit the spore production. So there's some interesting kind of non-chemical controls going on out there in, in some of the greenhouses. So the next pictures we got from the, the same homeowner were um, of Swiss chard. And so we got a good close-up picture of this one, which is which is awesome. And then just kind of a picture of the, the infected harvest here. Um, so the most common foliar disease of this kinopod family, which can infect our beets and our chard and our spinach, is a, another Circospora. So it's not the same exact fungi. There's over 1,200 species of Circospora, um, but this will produce these characteristic circular leaf spots. Um, you can see on this, this beet leaf here, they, they turn really red, but they might also be more brown in color. Uh, if you look close with a hand lens, you can actually see the sporulation on the leaf tissue. Um, once again, this one can overwinter in the in the soil and the spores actually penetrate through the stomates um, of the leaf tissue. So kind of interesting how it actually gets into the leaves there. So once again, with this one, clean seed, um, crop rotation is important. And if you if you have some plants that's in, that are infected, it might be better to go ahead and just harvest those, do a once over cut, as opposed to kind of you know just harvesting a little bit at a time because it's likely that it's going to spread um, throughout throughout the planting. Overhead irrigation, avoiding that again is is of importance, and potassium bicarbonate is also listed as a as a pesticide available to homeowners to control this one. So I just wanted to show you, you know, what this disease life cycle can look like. And so if we start at the bottom with the infected plant debris, as that plant debris decays um, on the soil, the pseudostromata uh, begins to form. And then that's after that is when the spores are actually dispersed and can uh, land on the leaf tissue through soil splash up and create, create further infection. So when we're thinking about fungal diseases, we think about duration of leaf wetness. So how long does that leaf tissue remain wet? That's why it's really important to avoid overhead irrigation. Um, you know, the relative humidity, we, we can't necessarily manipulate that, but we can give our plants adequate spacing so they get airflow. So at least the humidity right around the leaves is not elevated uh, because of the close spacing. Um, Soil splash up for, for Circospora, you know, so anything we can do to avoid soil splash up, um, you know, you have to be careful with uh, organic mulches sometimes on some of these leafy greens, the smaller leafy greens might encourage slugs, but, but uh, using mulches to prevent soil splash up can be, can be helpful. So 
you know, we've had some rainfall going on throughout the state, and it's pretty common to see some of these fungal diseases pop up um, following these heavy rainfall periods and, and high humidity periods. So, you know, whenever we get pictures in for the garden hour, um, we can offer, you know, a probable diagnosis based on the plant species, the visual symptoms, the weather, you know, the time of year. Um, but in order to, you know, diagnose something uh, 100%, we actually have a, a great MU plant diagnostic clinic where they can actually culture out these organisms and grow them and look them under a microscope. And we have a great um, diagnostician, Pong Tien, who works at the plant diagnostic clinic. So that's all I have on that. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next up, Debbie Kelly is going to um, talk about a picture we had submitted about uh, hosta damage. Yeah, hi, everyone. So this actually came in, and this was a picture that was submitted saying that they thought they had squash bug damage and wanted to know how to control the squash bugs. So I did a lot of searching to see if squash bugs were actually um, interested in the hostas and didn't really find too much about that at all. Um, so I'm suspecting that it, chances are it was not a squash bug. But this was a picture that was sent. And so the common things that we're looking for is one, I'm seeing the full plant, which is great, but I really need to see it much closer. So I, because this was an attachment in an email and not embedded in the email, I was able to blow the picture up to see what it looked like a little bit closer. And I did notice that there were still some full leaves that were there. Um, but I noticed that there's a lot of browning and with the sun shining in on it, it was still really difficult to kind of view. Uh, and so I was able to actually blow it up further and uh, got it into where the sun wasn't on it, but towards the back part of the plant. And it, to me, it looks as if all of these brown pieces of the, of the leaves that are hanging down is probably just the vein, the vein tissue, and that the full um, leaves were actually totally gone. I'm looking at this one down here. And I'm seeing a not quite a full leaf, but a, enough of a leaf. And I'm noticing that the browning of the plant of that leaf is actually coming on the edging and probably moving towards the center. And I'm seeing that on this leaf as best as I can, even though I see the sun is shining really hard on that. And I'm looking at this one and noticing. So I'm, I'm going to assume that the browning started on the edges moving inward. And so looking for some of this, what, what we, if we like hostas, we know what hostas are, they prefer the shade. Uh, they really suggest that you avoid full sun. I've seen people in my neighborhood right now that have uh, hostas in full sun and they are not looking good. Hostas also do require an inch and a half of water per week. So if you've got them in your uh, landscape, and you're not watering your landscape at all, and you've had these, we've had these drought conditions across the state. I know over in my county, we were in an abnormally dry. I was watering um, my trees and shrubs because I knew how important that was. So if you're not watering the hostas, that could be an effect for them. Just knowing that mulch, if you've got the mulch down, it helps to keep moisture into that soil before it doesn't dry out as quickly. Also, that layer of mulch helps to keep that soil cooler so that the roots don't have to get so hot from the sun penetrating on the soil. And hostas can become summer dormant if there's too much heat or from water stress. So those are things that we need to take into consideration as well when we're looking at hostas and what might be occurring with them. So here I've got down, uh, what are some of the major hosta pests that are out there? Slugs and snails, deer, of course we know deer like our hostas, rabbits, voles, nematodes, cutworms, grasshoppers, and one uh, extension publication research, I did find black vine weevil. I did do a bunch of searching to see if there's anything at all out there on squash bugs on hostas. I only came up with one uh, site that was asking about anything because they thought they had squash bug damage and wanted to know what they could do. So similar question. Uh, the answer to that wasn't very clear. 
Um, I also looked at the American Hospice Society website. They have a journal that they publish. And I did a search through their journals and I could not find anything that said squash bugs. What I'm going to assume by looking at those previous pictures that chances are that the plant was in sun because I don't know the direction of the sun that wasn't provided in the email. Um, I know that there was a, a short bush there. It looked like there was a wooden fence behind it. I don't know how much sun it's actually getting for the day. If there's a lot of questions that, and if it was watered, so questions that I don't know and can't have answered by just a picture. But I did do a little bit more searching. Um, and so just so it, squash bugs in general, just so that we know when you look at and, and ask what are the, the the plants that the squash bugs really prefer, it's going to be the pumpkins, summer and winter squash, zucchini, cucumbers, and then all the different variations of melons that are out there. Generally, when you have damage from squash bugs, you're going to see yellowing spots on the leaves. The leaves will become yellow, they will wilt, and then the actual leaves themselves will die. Um, so that is, is one of those conditions. And, and from looking at the picture that was sent in, I'm not seeing yellow spots on the leaves because we saw that one leaf that was in the bottom left that looked like it was solid green and the edges were totally brown turning. To me, that doesn't indicate any kind of a squash bug damage onto that leaf. But if we do have squash bugs, everybody wants to know how to get rid of them. So non-chemical ways of doing this are non, yeah, non-chemical ways. You can hand pick them off. You can use diatomaceous earth and you can sprinkle that around. So it will kind of do a little bit of damage, uh, scraping and scratching onto their body. Duct tape, which is Katie Candler's favorite way of controlling insects, is just take that duct tape and grab the eggs that are on the underside of those leaves. You can use insecticidal soap, but you'll have to continuously use that because it's not going to, it, it, they'll come back, they'll keep coming back. And the same with the neem oil, they'll keep coming back. But when you use the neem oil, you have to remember that the neem oil also needs to have a little bit of dish soap in it. Um, and then you have to make sure that um, that dish soap is then gonna have that oil adhere to the plant leaves and make sure you really, really saturate those leaves well, both the top and the bottom portions of the leaves. So my conclusion is that it's probably not the squash bugs. It's probably um, abiotic, which means nothing that's alive, which means then that we've got um, probably the weather, uh, the sun, watering and not knowing those full answers to those questions, I'm going to recommend that that's probably what the cause was. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, next up, uh, Pong Tian is going to talk about Dutch elm disease. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Pong Tian. I'm the director of, of, of MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. Today, we're going to talk about one single disease called a uh, Dutch elm disease. Uh, this disease is a lethal vascular disease for elm trees. Uh, it is caused by a uh, fungus uh, called uh, Ophiostoma almi. Uh, it is spread by an insect called elm bark beetles. It was believed that this disease was native to Asia and later introduced to America and Europe, uh, where the native population of the elm trees did not have the resistance to this disease. So you may wonder why it is why it is originally from Asia, but it was caused, it was called a uh, Dutch elm disease. Uh, so it actually due to the identification of this disease by a group of uh, Dutch plant pathologists. So I'm personally uh, really interested in history. Uh, so here, I would like to show you the scientists who are involved in this disease identification. So uh, Dr. Johanna uh, Westerdick, uh, she is the uh, Dutch plant pathologist. She firstly found this disease and then her student, uh, B. Schwartz, identify the disease and isolate this disease. 
So her, uh, her other student, Christine um, Busman, uh, successfully confirmed um, uh, Ms. Swartz's uh, findings. And she was also able to uh, develop a uh, cultivar, uh, which is resistant to DED disease. So currently there are still uh, two varieties of elm trees that were named by uh, Ms. Swartz and uh, Christine uh, Busman. So this is just really short and a brief history of this disease. Uh, now let's switch to the symptoms. So for the foliar symptom, this disease can cause the leaf, uh, mostly on the foliar, can cause foliar yellowing, browning, uh, dieback, flagging, and it can spread to the entire tree. So it will be look like this. If you look at this photo, you can see that this disease is likely spreading down the tree line, following the streets, uh, through the roots, uh, grafts between tree to trees. You can see here, uh, the entire canopy is almost gone and you have a kind of reduced um, uh, symptoms. And here you still have some healthy trees over here. So you can tell this disease can be transmitted by roots to roots interaction. Um, like I mentioned, this is a vascular disease. It can cause the vascular discoloration shown here in those two photos. You can look at the small twigs and cut it open to see whether you can see those discoloration to identify that. Uh, for the insects, it was uh, vectored by a small uh, shining uh, reddish brown uh, colored uh, beetle, which is very tiny, uh, one eighth uh, inches. And uh, this is insect they called a uh, European elm bark beetle. And they can uh, generate those uh, galleries under the bark. So this gallery, the shape of the gallery, the pattern is very diagnostic to identify this disease. Regarding the life cycle, since this is a vascular uh, disease, the fungus can be transmitted inside the vascular through the whole in, uh, entire tree. So it can not only cause a section of dieback, it will eventually kill the, the whole tree. And this disease can be transmitted by root to root interaction, by root grafting, and also can be transmitted by the beetles. The beetles will lay eggs into the wood. And uh, once the, uh, they can also call the gallery, which I showed you. So as long as you see those insects present in those woods, you will know that one of the most important disease management is not to move the wood. This photo showed uh, actually taken by one of my friends. He late, early this month, he went to Pittsburgh for a conference. On a way back, he took this photo and it clearly uh, this, this, uh, this, the pickup driver was carrying his wood from state to um, on the interstate road. This is actually really in, in dangerous because you, you don't know what insects or what disease you are carrying from state to state. You may accidentally introducing some new disease to another state. That actually leads to uh, the disease management uh, strategies for this disease. In addition to not to moving the wood, um, you have to promote a tree health. Uh, like Justin has mentioned, this year is a tough year for all plants. And uh, we have many days of with the dry and hot weather. And you may need to water uh, the plants during the drought, even in the winter. And sometimes the evergreen trees and deciduous trees, they may respond to the stress uh, in a more kind of like delayed time. So you may not see the uh, symptom uh, directly or right away. Uh, sometimes you may see some symptoms uh, later this year or next year. In addition to the tree health, uh, pro, uh, promoting tree health, uh, sanitation is really important. For elm tree, no matter it's healthy or dying or dead branches, I would recommend you to either bury them or burn them uh, to, to, to discourage all the colonization of the insects. Um, third, uh, breaking the root uh, grafts uh, by root uh, trenching method uh, that can reduce the roots root, uh, and plant-to-plant -plant interactions. Uh, there are fungicides available and uh, you can do some preventive trunk uh, injections. 
Uh, really, uh, we use uh, insect side to control the beetles because it's very difficult. And also the windows of this insect being active through the season is really narrow. It's really hard to get them. Uh, lastly, it's really important to plant some resistant or tolerant cultivars. And uh, it is recommended uh, not to plant them in a row so that they can avoid all the opportunity for the root interactions and for all the future uh, disease control. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Pong. Uh, next, we're going to take a short commercial break for Justin to uh, give an uh, update on a upcoming educational opportunity on produce safety and community gardens. Thanks, Katie. So, um, a lot of us at MU Extension were trained as produce safety trainers to help vegetable growers with complying with the uh, Food Safety Modernization Act. And we thought it would be really cool to kind of translate some of this information designed for growers and um, bring it to the community garden members and pantry garden members and, and homeowners as well. So, uh, you know, why do we need to think about this? Why is it important to to really consider some of the challenges and concerns of produce safety. Oh, here we go. So foodborne diseases are very, you know, widespread across the US. And I'm sure at some point uh, in your life, you've probably eaten something that made you, you know, not feel, not feel very well. You know, there's a ton of illnesses. Uh, a much lesser degree of hospitalizations, but there are a number of deaths across the U.S. every year. And so some of the most common foodborne pathogens um, that we're talking about, especially in produce safety, are, are salmonella, listeria, uh, and E. coli. Now, when we think about what crops are really causing these foodborne illnesses, it is a wide variety of crops. Um, but when we look at that big chunk of, of leafy greens and sprouts, that is, you know, full on half of, uh, of what we're looking at in terms of what kind of plants are folks eating that are, that are making them ill. And so why is, why is this the case? So the most risky produce in terms of foodborne illness and produce safety uh, is this produce that's eaten fresh. So, you know, a lot of our leafy greens, you might be eating raw spinach or kale salad, lettuce and things like that. You know, we're not cooking them. So there's not that kill step in there that that might be um, with some of our other produce. And the other factor is, is produce that's really close to the soil. Um, so, you know, things like our root veggies, um, also things like summer squash and all of our greens, you know, they're, they're in direct contact with the soil, they're receiving splash up from the soil. And so, you know, they're also what we would call at risk produce. So, you know, washing produce is always a good idea. Um, but if your produce is contaminated with a pathogen, it's pretty much impossible to to wash it out. So, you know, with the folds of leaf tissue or, you know, the shape of a strawberry, there's so many different surfaces and facets that those microorganisms can adhere to. Um, it's really, really challenging to actually clean that produce. So, you know, preventing contamination in the first place is really the best step. And in terms of, you know, how does this microbial contamination really occur? So, I mean, we can think about people, you know, health and hygiene, you know, how are, how are people washing their hands? Are they coming to the garden sick? Um, but we can also think about things like, you know, a water source. So, you know, uh, rain barrels, for instance, capture rainwater from roofs that might be contaminated with manure, uh, but other things like compost, equipment, um, our wild animals and pets, you know, all these, all these uh, different things can cause contamination issues. And so this contamination can occur within the garden, but it can also happen when we're harvesting and handling produce. Um, you know, also when we're storing produce or potentially in, in the home. So there's other contaminants besides these biological pathogens. Um, you know, we can think about physical contaminants in the garden, but also things like heavy metals that might be in urban areas in sight. So we're gonna talk all about that uh, at our upcoming class. You know, community gardens and food pantry gardens, they do have some unique challenges because there's so many people involved. Um, 
you know, you have your plot holders, you might have the community come coming to visit. Um, you probably have different animals, either wild or domestic, um, that are coming into the garden. So it can be hard to kind of control everything that's going on or to know what the previous use of the garden is. So there's ways that we can establish a culture of food safety and really encourage the use of what we call good agricultural practices, which are kind of the best recognized practices to prevent uh, produce safety risks and foodborne illness. So with, with good agricultural practices, we can kind of figure out what the major risk points are. We can figure out how to reduce those risk points and make sure that we're getting safe produce, both to gardeners and you know food pantries. So growing produce can be a risky business. We can't always eliminate every risk, but we can do a lot to reduce the risk and develop this uh, sense of a food safety culture. So if you're interested um, in our produce safety for community gardens class, um, we encourage community garden members, folks that works in food pantries, uh, master gardeners. If you're just a home gardener and want to learn more about this topic as well, this is a great class. So we'll go ahead and drop this um, link in the chat box. The class is going to be on September 12th via Zoom, um, and it, it tends to fill up quickly. So if you're interested, feel free to register or share this uh, information with, with other gardeners you know. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next up, Debbie Kelly is going to talk about crepe myrtle issues. Yeah, so crepe myrtle, I don't know if you've got any um, in your landscape. I know I've seen them around in my neighborhood. I have a start from my cousin. Uh, it's still in a pot uh, sunk into my raised bed. It, it's still really young. Um, so I'm excited for crepe myrtle. I really like crepe myrtles. I think that they're really pretty. Um, this is one that's in my neighborhood that's blooming right now. My dad um, has lived in Texas for the past oh, 25 to 30 years and crepe myrtle are just all over the place. Down there, they are um, grown as trees, which are really fun and interesting to see. So uh, the two uh, and the one in the middle and the one on the right are actually from pictures I took down in Texas, uh, which is really fun and interesting to see how these actually look and how they're slightly different from the bush site uh, kind of in the varieties that are out there. On our horticulture call a, a week or so, so two ago, there was a question that was brought up. Uh, and so that's why um, we wanted to share this with you. But in general, some of the culture as far as growing crepe myrtles is they can get anywhere between 10 to 30 feet tall and anywhere from 15 to 25 feet wide. They are very moderate to fast growers. They do have some really pretty variations of colors from white, pink, red to lavender. They bloom in early summer and go into the fall. So if you've got them around, you'll notice them because of their, their vivid colorations. They're also really pretty in the fall because the leaf color can change anywhere from a yellow to a red to an orange. And they add a lot of, of variety and, and interest into a landscape design. They are usually multi-trunked here um, in our section of the United States. They will overwinter. Uh, they do like full sun and they do like to have good air circulations through it. So if you leave it as a shrub, kind of the one that's on that picture on this page, there should be some good movement with the wind blowing and, and going through that. But there, it could be pretty dense in the center, so you might want to trim some of those out as it's growing. If the plant is growing in partial or full shade, there is a tendency for that plant then to have reduced flowering and an increase of disease susceptibility. So let's look at those things. Aphids, which is that picture on the bottom in the middle there, and uh, those are gobs of aphids that are all over um, the underside of the leaf of a crepe myrtle. Um, the, they have a piercing sucking mouth part, so they're going to actually pierce into the leaf tissue itself and suck all the sap out of that. Um, the picture on the right is one picture that I took from down in Texas. Um, when I was uh, walking by one, I was like, oh my gosh, look at that. Uh, that is called crepe myrtle bark scale. And it can do a lot of damage to the crepe myrtles that are out there. Fortunately for us, when I looked this up and saw a map, it is right on the border between um, Arkansas and Missouri. So 
uh, there could be a tendency um, with if we're having any kind of climate change that's occurring, um, that that beetle, I'm sorry, that scale could potentially move slowly further northward. But as of yet, that is not in Missouri. But I felt like it was important for you to see what it looks like should it ever occur in your landscape. At least you'll have an idea of what it could be. Also, Japanese beetles like uh, crepe myrtle. They eat the flowers and they also can skeletonize the leaves of the crepe myrtle. So what are some of the different diseases that are out there? Powdery mildew is the most common disease. Powdery mildew isn't gonna do a whole lot of damage to the crepe myrtle unless it just really covers it. Like this picture here, you can see the powdery mildew is consistent over all of those buds. And that may be detrimental to that particular plant. But if you've got some and it's not spread over the entire plant where the leaves are still green, can get photosynthesis, then your plant should be fine. There are some fungal leaf spots that are out there. Um, and I couldn't find a good picture to put into this, into this slide, so I apologize for that. Uh, but sooty mold is what was actually talked about on our call the other week. Um, and being a horticulturalist, she was asked to come down, neighbors asked her to come down and look at their crepe myrtle. And this more or less was what she was seeing is the leaves were turning totally black or portions of the leaves were actually turning black like that. And that's actually what's, what's, what that is, is that remember all those aphids in the previous slide, um, they leave a honeydew type of a, of a sap types on sticky on top of leaves and branches. And then following behind that is going to be this fungal um, matter, this mold matter that's actually gonna get onto the leaf and start to grow and it will cover those leaves. This is a really bad uh, condition for this one um, uh, picture on the right. And when that happens, there's not gonna be any photosynthesis that's gonna be occurring and that can be pretty detrimental to the crepe myrtle. So just wanted to share that with you, that that sooty mold is in Missouri. And so um, wanted you to see what that all is all about. And our okay. crepe myrtles hardy, this came in on the ask questions here. Um, our crepe myrtles hardy in zone five in North Missouri. Um, I Jennifer isn't on today, but I believe that she has mentioned in the past that crepe myrtles can grow up in the northern part of the state in protected areas from the winter, as well as trying to um, use some mulch and trying to keep that that um, area so it will grow um, uh, dormant over the winter and grow go all the way back down to the ground and will come back up again, but it's got to be in some protected areas. And that's what I've got, Katie. All right. Do you want to um, go ahead and show our little snippet video of elderberry harvest? Because I have noticed driving around right now that the elderberries are getting ripe. And we apologize ahead of time for any tech difficulties. We had some attempts earlier and the video is a little choppy. Elderberry and elderflower farm with Sherry Hagenhoff and Sherry has about three acres of elderberries mm -hmm. here on the farm mm -hmm. and you are starting to harvest and you've been very busy so why don't you tell us about what you look for okay. when you get ready to harvest. Well they don't all come ripe at the same time so we're finding that every day we do a walk through to see what's ready or not. Um, we're, I'll show you this one. This actually is a very nice head, very fully ripened. Um, there are very few red berries. Occasionally you'll have some unripe things, but that would be a perfect head for harvest today. So we'll make sure we get that guy in. So not only do not all the um, berries, if you go in the background just a little bit, you can see there are green heads plus our cymes, and then there are some darker cymes. But if we look right here, at this one there's a lot that's fully ripened and we would certainly pick this fully ripened and then you're going to see that there's always just a few stubborn guys these green ones in here that don't want to ripen frankly here we would go right ahead and pick this whole thing if this sometimes we'll see the whole thing um, there's different branches here so if you see 
how that splits off. Sometimes we'll cut everything but that one in the middle and we'll let it stay and ripen so that we'll go back and just harvest a little tiny clump. And it might be two or three days, but these are, these are good to pick today. They're great. And back behind it is a gorgeous big head. And this guy, same thing. Here we have a few more red. And so we kind of use a rule of thumb of, uh, I tell my pickers, if we see close to 80% or more ripe, go right ahead and pick it. I wouldn't leave this on the bush just because of those few unripe ones. One of the reasons for that is, for instance, today, it's only going to be in the upper 70s. There's a bug called the spotted wing drosophila, and we would not want to allow the spotted wing drosophila to get the whole rest of the harvest here for the sake of 10 berries that aren't ripe. So we we generally try to make sure that we're, we're getting most of the berries, not the SWD bug. Here's a great example right here. This one we would not harvest because we've got so much unripe. These are barely starting to ripen. So we would leave this guy just hanging for another day or two. And then when we're doing our processing, we make sure and we check for the SWD, the spotted wing drosophila, and just put them in a little bit of salt water and see if those worms are coming up. You're going to see all different sizes. As a general rule, they'll start ripening lower. And as you go harvesting, the higher, later into the harvest, the higher the har the signs that you're going to be picking, but that's not always true. There's always something. So what happens is, this all right, if you want to see the entire video, it is on our YouTube channel and um, that video link is in uh, in the chat box. And while we are short on time, I've got one little last snippet because I want to get it in today because it goes so well with what Donna talked about and with what Justin talked about. So I am going to talk about pre-harvest interval, or it's abbreviated PHI on uh, labels. So if you are applying an insecticide, this example is an insecticide. So I went and got uh, a common used insecticidal label. And um, you notice that this uh, pre-harvest interval varies depending on what crop you are spraying it on. Uh, so whether it is a um, chemical or organic insecticide or fungicide, they all have pre-harvest intervals. And every label will look a little different and have a little different information. So in this case, you can see vegetables, so brassicas versus sweet corn versus cucurbits. Um, there are different days. So it could be one day, it could be three days, or down here in the case of our um, dried legume vegetables, it's 21 days. Uh, so look at that. And that's on vegetables. And then the same label also on berries, fruits, and nuts has different pre-harvest intervals depending on what it is. So grapes was only one day where your apples and apricots and peaches, those were 14 days. Uh, and that was for a, a common insecticide. These are for, uh, it's a common fungicide. So I just uh, picked a, a page and so this was vegetables and that pre-harvest interval um, was 14 days on sweet corn where it was zero days on cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, and squash. This is why it's so important to read that label for what um, it says and what that pre-harvest interval is. And um, this label was nice enough to uh, tell you what PHI means. Uh, some labels don't have that. So um, that's why uh, that abbreviation is important and figuring out what that means is important. And this was the fungicide on vegetables. This is the same label for a fungicide that was on fruit. So notice it does not have a column here for PHI. So, but in the uh, application notes, it says also apply one to two weeks after petal fall when fruit begins to form. So these are not sprayed anytime after that. 
it is uh, early in the season. This one also says apply once more when fruit begin, just begins to form. So this is not a late season fungicide. And then finally, uh, just a quick garden myth that has come in several times this year is that uh, people wanna know or are concerned that plant diseases will transfer to humans and it does not work that way. However, you do know that, that Justin talked about um, food-borne illness. Those are from contaminants, not actually plant diseases. So here was just a kind of an assortment. This pumpkin has uh, some type of, of disease. So if I was going to actually use that pumpkin, I could cut that out and, and the rest would still be edible. However, I would tell you that this is a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. It is not one that I would um, desire to go to that work and actually eat. In the right-hand corner is a sweet potato, and that sweet potato, um, those uh, crevices in that were actually caused by a virus. So once again, not going to hurt us. That sweet potato is edible. Is it very fun to peel or do anything with? No, <laughs> or marketable, but um, still perfectly fine to eat. These tomatoes, actually not a disease problem, or more cracking and weather-related environmental conditions. Um, this one has a little cat facing on it. Still, you could cut those, those parts out and still use the rest of the tomato. And then lastly, hopefully, there's the other picture I have. Now, in this case, this last picture, you notice those, those funny spots on those tomatoes? Well, um, this was a high tunnel grower that I work with that had a coon get in his high tunnel. So it's very different when you have, um, once again, like, like uh, Justin was talking about animal contamination. Now these, I would not uh, definitely don't eat. <laughs> don't, uh, you can't clean that off um, where, where the teeth marks have been in that tomato from the raccoon. So that finishes up. Uh, talking about some pre-harvest intervals and um, so, some uh, common uh, diseases in the vegetable garden. So I'll turn it back over to Justin to finish us off. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, really appreciate all the information and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I know we always have a lot of great information in the chat box. Um, if you click on the three little dots on the bottom right hand side here, it will give you the option to save that chat so you can keep those links for future reference. Um, we also have a great YouTube channel um, where you can live stream um, the broadcast of the Garden Hour and you can also check out um, our full Garden Hour as well as our snippets so you can always come back to review any information or, or definitely share these with other gardeners that uh, would be interested. Um, so we're going to stay on our weekly schedule here. And in terms of the content, we love to get questions from all across the state of Missouri. And so um, you can submit your questions at ipmmissouri.edu slash town halls. And so when you get to that landing page, um, you'll be requested to enter some information here as well as your question. And then you can also, uh, there's an option to attach pictures. We love seeing the pictures. Um, sometimes the more the better. Um, sometimes, you know, we like to see pictures close up of disease issues. We like to see the plant as a whole. So definitely go ahead and drop your um, information in there and submit questions. And we'll, we'd be loved to, we'd love to include those in the town hall um, as we go along. So just to share again, our slide of our MU Extension Field Specialist in Horticulture, um, we have coverage all across the state. Um, we'd love to get your questions and help folks out. If you're in an open territory where there's currently not a horticulturist covering, um, just feel free to reach out to one of your neighboring horticulturists and we'd be happy to help you out. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you next week at the MU Extension Garden Hour.